this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy. And I am in conversation with Dr. James Bratt, Professor Emeritus uh, at uh, Calvin University in Michigan. And he has co-authored a book uh, that is a religious biography of Franklin D. Roosevelt, which uh, and of course many people don't appreciate uh, that uh, FDR was uh, a religious person and had a lifelong involvement uh, with the Episcopal Church. So uh, this book is important and uh, much needed. So Dr. Brad, I appreciate your joining us for this conversation. Yeah, I'm glad for the occasion and the opportunity. Would you have a copy of the book within reach? I do not. I am at our, um, our uh, summer place uh, sheltering down and I am afraid I left all my copies at home. <laughs> Well, could you tell us the full title of the book and how you came to uh, write it with uh, your late co-author? Okay, the title of the book is A Christian and a Democrat, a uh, religious biography of Franklin Roosevelt. And um, the Democrat in there refers to um, FDR's own political party, of course, but also to his um, fundamental belief in democracy as, um, as um, really the best possible arrangement um, that um, had been given and emerged by providence, and he, he believed in providence fully as much as the founders used that term. Um, so it was um, kind of, to him, democracy was a test of a good society, and it was the fullest potential, fullest um, possible fulfillment of um, the good potential um, in humanity. Now, the, t uh, the phrase itself was his off-the-cuff uh, response to a kind of a snarky query by a correspondent in one of his many, many hundreds of press conferences. Uh, Mr. President, what's your political philosophy? And Roosevelt was no philosopher, and he blah, 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 kind of uh, muttered a little bit and said, why? Well, I'm, I'm a Christian and a Democrat, and that's all. Um, so my, um, my colleague, um, the late professor um, and, and reverend uh, John Wolverton, um, was for a long time uh, kind of the dean of Episcopalian historians in the United States. He edited the Anglican and Episcopal Review, their journal. And uh, he took a poll once of his subscribers, uh, what topics in Episcopal history, US Episcopal history need to be examined? And they came up with a bunch of suggestions. But the one that he was looking for uh, and that no one else picked up on, so he decided to give himself to, was um, the religion of Franklin Roosevelt. Um, so he um, taught for a long time at Virginia Theological Seminary. That's in uh, Alexandria, the um, longstanding Episcopal Seminary. He then uh, retired from that uh, for parish ministry up in Maine and devoted himself to more to writing. And uh, this was his last book. He had um, a great big manuscript, um, kind of ready to go, but not really. Um, and he died in his mid 80s um, with that unfinished. And by a circu circuitous route, uh, that manuscript came to me. I solicited it and I played book doctor on it. I reduced the full volume by about uh, 25, 30% added a short chapter of my own, rearranged a lot of the material, and um, uh, just made, made it more readable, let's say. Well, as I mentioned, uh, most people don't appreciate uh, that FDR was uh, religious. Uh, the exception seems to have been Winston Churchill, who organized that uh, magnificent uh, Anglican church service on the deck of a battleship when they first met in the North uh, Atlantic, knowing that would appeal to FDR. Yeah. But why is there so little uh, widespread knowledge about FDR's religiosity? Well, he didn't um, observe a lot of the conventional um, customs of it. Um, he, he loved to go to church on particularly ceremonial occasions, high points, Christmas and Easter, but also every anniversary of his inauguration and, and other high points, national days of prayer. Um, but he was not um, an every Sunday in church in the pew kind of guy. Um, he wasn't much of a theologian, although as one chapter in this book shows, um, he did have kind of a, um, an odd night with um, 
uh, dinner and a long discussion with uh, the foremost American authority on Soren Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard really struck deeply into Roosevelt's consciousness that night. Um, he, um, for, for Rose, he did read his prayer book um, um, nightly before he went to bed. He read his prayers. That was his ritual. Um, and he, um, but, but for him, Christianity was in the doing. Christianity was in the doing. And um, it, was, it, it was in the heart, creating a heart of compassion for ordinary people. He thought that he thought that that's what Jesus was about, and um, this understanding came to him um, in terms that we would label the social gospel of the um, early uh, late nineteenth, early twentieth century. His wife uh, Eleanor was steeped in that. Uh, one of the most important cabinet officers, Frances Perkins, she was the first female cabinet member and Secretary of Labor, and really the architect of some of the most important New Deal legislation, such as Social Security. Frances Perkins was deeply devoted to the social gospel and very much um, a weekly participant in um, uh, Anglo-Catholic liturgy. She would go, while a cabinet officer, she would go <clears throat> once a month to uh, a nearby convent in Maryland, an Anglo-Catholic convent, and uh, do a weekend um, retreat. Um, and so these are the kind of people, uh, Eleanor, Francis Perkins, and also his headmaster at Groton, um, Roosevelt's headmaster at Groton, kind of a replacement father for him, um, Endicott Peabody, who was um, uh, deeply devoted to Christian responsibility and tried to cultivate that into the rising um, American ruling class of the Gilded Age. Um, so these these people were very instrumental in in um, fashioning Roosevelt's outlook, and um, for him, uh, New Deal legislation was turning Christian injunction into uh, social political policy that would help the ordinary lives of ordinary people. Well, you mentioned um, the social gospel's impact on FDR's uh, domestic policies, uh, obviously the New Deal. Uh, but I'm sure that they had just as deep an impact on how he viewed the world and ultimately uh, what informed his uh, resistance to uh, Nazism and Japanese material, uh, militarism during uh, World War II and his deep commitment to democracy, which you cited. Yeah. Um, Roosevelt was not looking toward being a, um, a foreign policy president, but um, <laughs> as Lincoln said, um, we don't meet history, history meets us. And uh, this is where history took him. Um, and there was, there was something deeply e to, to Roosevelt. It wasn't just a bad, oppressive political system, but Nazism represented um, a real negation of um, um, human dignity. Um, of the, we would say, uh, the image of God that was planted in all human beings, Christian or not. This was a negation of everything and every possibility of good and uh, uh, mutual respect and, um, and the development of, of uh, the human soul. And um, boy, he, he just instinctively bridled at this and um, worked his political magic to, um, <laughs> by hook and crook, and by a, a very spare measure sometime, get the United States ready to combat this. Um, one of the things that, going back to your previous question, one of the things that doesn't, that makes Roosevelt not seem a real pious guy is that he was a wily politician, right? He really knew how to play the game. And the way that politician, rings in the American ear today. It's um, everything uh, conniving, inauthentic, deceptive, uh, manipulative. Um, and so you can't be a, a good politician and a good um, consistent Christian. And for Roosevelt, no, um, you, um, without being dishonest or um, uh, underhanded, 
you use the rules, you follow the rules and the devices of this game to um, aim for um, a really good common end and an elevated end. So um, Reinhold Niebuhr didn't like him much, Roosevelt, but came to appreciate him, particularly when the move from um, uh, domestic to foreign policy. And so um, <laughs> Roosevelt is kind of a, uh, a walking textbook of, of Niebuhrian political ethics. <laughs> is there any evidence FDR uh, knew who Niebuhr was or was in any way influenced by him? Nope, we, um, we don't have uh, much evidence of that. Um, Niebuhr ran in different circles, um, uh, church-wise, than, than Roosevelt did. Um, so we do have this really weird confrontation with uh, Kierkegaard. But um, the people that, um, that uh, Roosevelt responded to were more um, the lions of social and political thinking in the Episcopal Church. He was. He was very much as um, that church called itself. He, he was very much a churchman, okay? Um, he was very ecumenical in his outlook. He thought that, um, you know, there were, you know, every, every denomination had, um, had its own take and these were all good and uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't certainly not um, spur antagonism over denominational uh, barriers, but, um, uh, capacious as he was in terms of his own um, practical um, uh, thinking and uh, relationships, he was very much an Episcopalian. Uh, how much evidence is there in terms of how his uh, Christian beliefs accepted his um, response to uh, paralysis from polio? Yeah, I think that this was well, there's this very controversial and ancient um, uh, theory in theology about the fortunate fall, right? That it was good that Adam and Eve fell because else, you know, uh, some people say that's a horrible doctrine. Some people think it's no, it's a defensible doctrine. I think in the same way we can say that uh, Roosevelt's contraction of polio was in one horrible way, uh, the making of him. Uh, it was not a good thing but a lot of good came out of it. Up to that time, Roosevelt, I mean, he, this was a guy born into the pamper, a pampered only son of the ruling class, right? That big estate up on, um, in Hyde Park, up on the Hudson, um, the easy uh, entry into Groton, the easy entry into Harvard, uh, hanging around with the best of the brightest and the, and the callow ruling class. Um, this is the way he struck, Roosevelt struck people when he moved to DC as uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy in uh, 1913 uh, uh, for the duration of, of World War I. Um, he struck a lot of people as just a pampered son of privilege. And I think there was always more to him than that, but a polio knocked those, if you will, <laughs> those crutches out from under him. Um, he really knew what suffering was. It, <clears throat> almost like the Grinch, it opened his heart. Um, he was now dependent on people. Um, he met ordinary people the way he otherwise would not have. So when he's developed the, the, the spa, uh, the Cure Spa down at Warm Springs, he has this jerry-built um, automobile that he could operate simply by hand. And he would take long winding rounds, uh, ro trips around the, um, the mud roads of Georgia and meet ordinary, you know, mule and plow uh, farmers and talk with them and see these young people at Warm Springs around him who, whose bright promise of youth had seemed to, seemingly been, been cut off, uh, crippled for life. And um, he was kind of a pastor down at Warm Springs. He, uh, in, in inspiration of hope, um, um, having people look on the possibilities they still had rather than being defined by their limitations and what they lacked. Um, so it really um, broadened his heart, uh, deepened his compassion, and um, called forth pastoral qualities in him and made him um, existentially sensitive 
not just as a calculating politician, but existentially sensitive to, to human weakness, human suffering, and uh, most of all, what could be done about that. Because he saw that Warm Springs um, um, showed that you could do something collectively about this malady. And just as he had been paralyzed in the early 20s, so when he came on the national scene, uh, assumed the presidency in the early 30s, the nation was paralyzed. Well, this guy knew from paralysis and he knew how to uh, go after it. I recall that uh, right after he uh, came down with uh, polio and literally could not move any part of his body, uh, for a few days he felt like he literally had been forsaken by God, but moved on from that, and his faith seems to have been fairly secure. Uh, in contrast, I wonder if um, Eleanor, who was also uh, a lifelong Episcopalian, if she was more uneven in her faith, but how did they relate to each other in terms of their religious beliefs? Um, yeah, that's a good, good insight you have. Eleanor was a deeper diver than Franklin into what we would call philo philosophical and theological questions. So um, she uh, looked at the wide variety of human religious experience and kind of got shook at, uh, as we, <laughs> we all have, you know, about the relativity of it all. Um, how do we know which of these options is true? There's some crazy things out there in the religious record. I mean, <laughs> is this back crazy or what? And so she would, she would bring this up to Franklin and he said, <laughs> no, no, my dear. Um, it's good that we not make final pronouncements on things that we cannot fathom. So he had this, you know, William James would call Roosevelt, I think, uh, the consummate once born person in a sense. Uh, even after his polio, uh, as you said, he had that dark night of the soul for just a couple days or a couple weeks. Um, but... <clears throat> He had this um, deep sense of, um, of calling and of confidence and that um, God or the cosmos loved him and that if he just did his duty, things would be okay for him. He was never uh, shaken from that, although he had that one uh, deep dive in, into doubt. Eleanor on the other, and, and this is partly in, uh, owing, I think, to FDR's uh, childhood. Um, his, he was the, uh, the, the one um, child of a very doting um, and very uh, <laughs> strong mother, <clears throat> just filled him, and, and his, also his social privileged position. Um, the, these together communicated to him, instilled deep inside him the idea that the world is basically a good place, and that you're okay, I'm okay, and um, I can do, um, I can do good things, and I'm called to do good things. It's a responsibility too. Eleanor, if you'll pardon my French, literally had a hell of a childhood. Uh, alcoholic father, callow mother, uh, orphaned early on, um, lived with some relatives, had to have triple locks put on her bedroom doors to keep her from the predations of her uncles. I mean. Uh, it's amazing to me that she came through this with um, um, as strong and deep um, a conviction and commitment as she did. So I think she was a twice-born soul uh, in James's terms. And she would, um, yeah, so she would entertain these sorts of things. Mm. Um, so she was... Um, he was kind of the good cop religiously. She was, <laughs> she was a tough cop. And, uh, but she, she's the one who um, got in touch with this rector at St. John's um, Episcopal at Lafayette Square, the, um, the, the Kierkegaard maven. She had in, invited him over for this dinner. And um, um, so she would entertain um, a guy like, like Reverend Johnson um, who, uh, ha, I mean, there's no deeper diver than Kierkegaard and, mm. uh, Eleanor resonated to that. And she, uh, Franklin was interested because he was trying to fathom, um, the iniquity of a guy like Hitler. 
um, the collective iniquity that uh, the Fuhrer could lead a whole people into. How in the world could this happen? And uh, Johnson gave him a one night seminar in uh, Kierkegaardian understanding of that. Mm. I really wandered around on that. <laughs> to <answer your> question. <laughs> uh, that's a fascinating uh, anecdote about that evening with uh, Kierkegaard. I recall that uh, there was some resentment between the uh, senior rector at St. John's Episcopal in DC and uh, St. Thomas Episcopal because FDR preferred going to St. Thomas's, which he had gone to as uh, assistant Navy secretary during World War I, which the rector at the Church of the President, St. John's, of course, uh, was jealous of and much <laughs> resented. But uh, I guess despite that resentment, the, the assistant rector had that enjoyable evening with FDR yeah. and Eleanor. Well, FDR threw St. John's a bone because um, every uh, inaugural, well, the, the, the uh, pre-inaugural prayer service, which, by the way, Roosevelt uh, inaugurated, that was, that was uh, the president-elect did not do that before. Um, he held that at St. John's, and every subsequent year until uh, wartime that would be held at St. John's, then during the war, for security reasons, it would be held in the East Room. Hmm. But um, these were these were religiously um, peak moments for Roosevelt. Um, this was a time when he could publicly uh, humble himself and in a way humble the nation with him to the great calling and duty that history or providence had imposed on him. In other words, he could own up to um, um, what passed through his mind the night of um, the election um, in, in November of 1932. His uh, oldest son, James, helped put FDR to bed that night, as always. And uh, Roosevelt looked at us and said, Jimmy, I am scared. <laughs> I am scared. I, I, I have undertaken here. I have been put in a situation that is immense beyond anybody's power to understand or deal with. And I'm afraid I'm going to fail. So um, I'm going to pray tonight, Jimmy, and I want you to pray for me too. Mm. Um, Roosevelt then ritualized that, and I don't mean ritualize here in a pejorative sense at all. I think rituals are really important. He ritualized, ritualized that for the nation by having this prayer service before the inaugural uh, in which we collectively pour out our need, our inadequacy, our hope, and our faith before this transcendent power, and then go on in confidence from that because for folks like Roosevelt, um, if you pour it out all before God, you know that it's going to be good mm. <laughs> because God loves you. <laughs> well, you mentioned uh, his church attendance was um, uneven. I think he explained once he didn't like people watching him uh, while he prayed. But he was uh, a serious churchman, as you mentioned. And um, am I correct in recalling that even as president, he was still on the vestry of the Hyde Park Episcopal Church? and had phone conversations with the rector about the church's budget? He remained, he was appointed to the vestry um, as a very young man. Um, and he remained on the vestry at St. James Hyde Park um, until his death. And some years in the, uh, during the war, he was, uh, he was chair of the vestry. Um, and so, um, yeah, he was in regular communication with um, with the rector and with the with the vestry about about fundraising, about you know, do we really need a new rug <laughs> in the in the narthex? Uh, oh no, we have one up at, at the house in Hyde Park. You can have that one. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this correspondence going back and forth, uh, soup to nuts. Um, but um, I think. Um, Religion, as in many ways, his whole politics was very local for Roosevelt. I mean, he he was uh, the heir of kind of the country squire of Hyde Park, right? And his own father was old enough to be his grandfather. Um, his father modeled that. I mean, his father was very well connected. He was a friend of Grover Cleveland. Cleveland wanted him, uh, James Roosevelt, to take an ambassadorship and so forth. And he, he could have really been a climber and a doer, but James, 
saw his duty to be uh, local and uh, took on all these uh, posts of responsibility and leadership in the Hyde Park area. And one of those was being on the vestry. And I think that's where um, religion really caught for Roosevelt. So even though he wasn't at Hyde Park um, uh, every Sunday while he was president, um, in a way his heart was there and his religious center was there. Um, so just as he viewed um, the presidency in a way as being um, a squire for America, instead of just for one village on the Hudson. So um, his, his religious locale, his soul's ease in, um, in St. James Church in Hyde Park, I think kind of stayed with him. Mm -hmm. During his presidency, I recall, he enjoyed uh, going to Christmas services at uh, Foundry Methodist Church and took Churchill there for um, Christmas after uh, Pearl Harbor. And he wrote a note at the time saying he was going to take Churchill to go sing hymns with the Methodist. Yes. And I always wondered uh, how this high-born Episcopalian from New York even knew about the Methodist. <laughs> but when, I, when I went to Warm Springs down in Georgia one time, I learned that, that when he first started going there in the 20s, there were no Episcopal churches uh, in that part of rural Georgia. So he started going to Methodist churches and singing hymns with the Methodist. So yeah. that this solved that mystery for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, the uh, the relationship between the Anglicans and the damnable Methodies goes way back, you know, to the time of Wesley himself. But uh, no, there was a there was a Methodist church in Hyde Park. It had been one of the earliest ones, and um, um, Roosevelt loved it. Um, I mean, his his um, religiously, his heart and soul was in the prayer book, not in the sermons but in the prayer book and especially in the hymns. He loved hymns and he especially loved Methodist hymns. Um, and so if he would have a spontaneous effusion of spirituality, it would come out with um, in, in singing those hymns. So he knew this from a child as um, a boy in the neighborhood. Uh, I didn't know that about Warm Springs, um, but uh, yeah, Foundry, um, um, might have been a little high tone for him, but um, <laughs> maybe that little higher tone was good for Churchill. <laughs> but his favorite hymn, speaking of hymns, his favorite hymn was the Navy hymn. Of course, he was a, a Navy secretary or assistant secretary. His, um, his heart was, was in the Navy. Um, I think that's one reason that Pearl Harbor was such a cataclysm of event for him, obviously, on the geopolitical front, obviously, is a call to war, but that the Navy was the first victim of Pearl Harbor, and that the Navy, for that matter, had really screwed up. Mm. That really, that really hurt him. But um, Eternal Father Strong to Save, the Navy hymn, um, which uh, you and I probably remember from the uh, Kennedy funeral, huh? Um, I knew different lyrics to that hymn, Creator Spirit by Whose Hand, um, uh, and I wonder why were they playing, I was an eighth grader, why are they playing that at Kennedy's funeral? What was the Navy hymn? I didn't know that, but that was his favorite hymn. Onward Christian Soldiers was a pretty close second. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones they played that Churchill set them up for, of course, yes. on, um, on the warship in, um, in the Nova Scotia Bay, <laughs> or Newfoundland, Newfoundland yeah. Well, final question for you. You're a scholar of uh, Abraham Kuyper. Uh, is there yeah. the great uh, Dutch uh, statesman and um, theologian, I suppose you could call him. Uh, is there oh, yeah, any absolutely. overlap at all between Kuyper and FDR? Um, well, it's, it's interesting that um, uh, Kuyper's uh, movement, the anti-revolutionary movement, anti-French revolutionary atheism in his mind, um, his uh, anti-revolutionary movement is the premier Protestant version of the movement of Christian democracy in uh, 19th century Europe, right? You have a Christian Democratic Party in Italy, France, Germany, the Center Party, and so forth. Um, and I view, um, I mean, my title of the Kuiper biography, which I finished before this FDR project came out, is um, uh, Abraham Kuiper, um, Modern Calvinist Christian Democrat. And uh, Christian, dem Christian democracy was a dear concept to Kuiper. 
um, democracy um, with its high view of human dignity and its uh, concern for, um, for all people regardless of station. Um, Kiefer himself kind of had a prefer op preferential option for the poor in his own way, in his own time. Um, this was a high, dear value for Kuiper, but he thought uh, you needed um, a robust sense of the transcendent. You needed, in his terms, um, Christian values and worldview to uh, center that and to uphold it. Um, democracy could survive only if it had um, eternal foundations and transcendent, transcendent references. Um, in a much, I mean, and Kuiper's first job was as a theologian. That was his PhD. That was his job. That, that was his publication. So he's very much a theologian. He was far more theologically versed <laughs> than Roosevelt. Um, he was not the pampered son of privilege by any means. But in, in um, there is, I think, a deep um, overlap between their, uh, well, for uh, Kuiper were very conscious assumptions and um, uh, what were for Roosevelt kind of um, of an intuitive gyroscope. So Kuiper is a systematic thinker um, to a fault. Uh, Roosevelt is a, um, a dodging and weaving operator, maybe to a fault. Mm -hmm. But um, so they're very different temperaments and types of people. But um, yeah, I think there is. Um, um, uh, an overlap, and I find it interesting that in um, the, the the most Kuiperian voices in the Great Depression, um, in in around West Michigan, were fans of Roosevelt, hmm. so they, they picked up that connection. Even though that was a very Republican area, I assume. oh yeah, they got in trouble for it. Yeah, hmm. <laughs> they got in trouble for it. But um, when you look at, um, I mean. Kuiper is famous or infamous for, for uh, being suspicious of government, but um, he was also really suspicious of, of the so-called free market because he knew how consolidated corporate power could distort the proper operations of the free market. So he, he was for um, an activist or for a strong state in setting up um, what we would call safety net. and. Um, uh, a secure, uh, secure environment in which the operations of the market should then go forward. So he was not a laissez-faire. Uh, he, he really, dis Kuiper really disliked what he called Manchester economics, you know, the, the laissez-faire prescriptions of uh, some capitalists. He wanted, um, uh, he, he, he wanted um, what Roosevelt would see in, uh, as a reform capitalism, um, a capitalism that was tethered, had the blunt edges ripped, uh, uh, blunted, um, and was, um, was regulated to um, allow um, operational security for, for people of all and any means in, in the marketplace. So um, the better business people, Republicans in West Michigan, I'm thinking of the Herman Miller people, and steel case and so forth, have had this attitude as well. Um, kind of a, um, a, G a Jerry Ford kind of republicanism. Hmm. Well, uh, Dr. Pratt, uh, thank you so much for a very enjoyable conversation about your religious biography of FDR, a Christian and a Democrat. Yeah, my, I appreciate very much the opportunity to talk about it. I hope um, lots of your folks read it and um, I welcome, um, conversation about it by email and so forth. You can find me on the uh, history department uh, site at uh, Calvin University. So um, my email is there. Uh, love to hear from you. Very good. Thank you again. Yeah. See you.